folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. Somebody sent me a video a while back. I featured it on the Pastor Mike Online live broadcast. And if you don't know what that is, every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Central Time, uh, I do a live broadcast. You can get that at practically any of our websites. But anyway, somebody sent me a video, um, and it was rather interesting. I don't pay a whole lot of attention to YouTube videos. This one, this one caught my eye. Here is a screen capture of it. It featured a uh, what looks like a giant footprint. Somewhere in South Africa, there's actually, uh, I kind of cropped the photo a little bit, there's someone standing next to this thing. This footprint itself, if it in fact is that, is somewhere around three to four feet long. I mean, it's, it, it's actually bigger than, than my footprint. And it's embedded on a rock that uh, is uh, straight up and down. Now, you ask the question, okay, number one, uh, how can a footprint be that big? Number two, how can it be up on a wall like that and so on? Didn't someone carve this out? Um, I'll say maybe. And the reason why I say maybe is because I believe the Bible. Now, uh, over the next couple Watchmen video broadcasts, this is what's going to happen. If you believe the Bible, if you just believe this book right here, then you won't have a problem believing what I'm going to share with you. If you don't believe the Bible, exactly what it say, well, I'm a Christian, I just don't believe everything in the Bible. Well, then you're going to have, a, I can tell you right now, you're going to have a big problem with some things that I'm going to say in here because I'm going to talk about what I think this, if this footprint is real, I'm going to talk about what I think this is all about and why I think it's possible that at one time giants roamed the earth. Now, if you were, if you were to just kind of think about stories in your mind about giants, giants, uh, I mean, we know about giants. They're in all of our myths, all of our legends, all of our stories. Uh, King Arthur. King Arthur fought a giant. There's this tale about King Arthur. Uh, killing a giant. Now, some people say King Arthur never existed, hence, therefore, he never killed a giant. But we have stories like that from, from all over the world, even in Hindu mythology. They have a story of giants, kind of like human beings, kind of like half-god things, and they're very, very, very tall people. They're called the Deityas. Then Greek mythology, you have the Gigantes, and they were, so according to Greek mythology now, according to Greek mythology, the Gigantes, this big, tall, you have the Roman Titans, it's sort of the same thing. Um, they are the, uh, the offspring of a god called Tartarus. No, that's not where we get tartar sauce from. A, a god named Tartarus and a goddess named Gaia. Now, you might, you might sort of recognize those two names. Tartarus just happens to be one of the Greek words used in the Bible that is translated as hell. And in fact, the, the word Tartarus gives this idea of the lowest, the lowest part of hell, or like the, the bottomless pit. Um, Gaia, you've probably heard this before. Gaia is the earth goddess. She's the goddess of fertility. We talked about her several times before. She has gone by different names like Ashtaroth, Ishtar, um, Isis, Venus, and so on. There's a goddess all around the earth. She's always worshipped the same way through fertility. And so this idea that the Greeks had this idea that a, a god from like the lowest part of the earth mated with mated with Gaia, some sort of goddess creature, and they created these very, very tall, gigantic creatures that they call, we, we, our word gigantic, and the word giant actually comes from this particular word. And who doesn't remember, who doesn't remember the story of Jack and the Beanstalk? I remember this story from I, I, when I was young, I was always hoping to find these magic beans that I could throw out the window, and there's giant vine going, uh, ascending all the way up into heaven. And you remember the story: Jack climbs up the beanstalk, and he's up in this, he's up in the cloud, and he finds out there's a great big giant up there. I forgot to mention, and I think this might end up in some of the some of the stories of Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, depending on what version you're looking at. The the giants of Greek mythology. Here's something interesting. It had like one eye right here. I hope I'm not writing on my forehead. They had one eye right here, okay? Uh, this part was blank. They were called the Cyclops. I think that's interesting in 
that might fit into something uh, that we look at here in a little bit. Uh, in, even in British folklore, uh, this is actually in the, uh, their statues in the Guild Hall, which is the, like the City Hall of London. The, the Lord, excuse me, the Lord Mayor of London, there's a, there's a procession every year that features what are supposedly the two giants that protect London. They're named Gog and Magog. Here's a picture of the uh, Royal Arcade in Melbourne, Australia, that's modeled after the Guildhall in London, uh, which was erected originally erected in 1708. And it features the two protectors of London, and they're named Gog and Magog. Now, <clears throat> this is interesting. I don't know if you know this. The words Gog and Magog actually come from this book here. This is Ezekiel 38, Son of Man, set thy face against Gog. And when somebody, when God says set your face against them, that means God's saying, I'm not for them. Okay, I'm not for them. Maybe London needs to pick out two other, something better to protect London. Anyway, Gog and Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, Gog and Magog, if you know a little bit about Bible prophecy, Ezekiel 38, Gog and Magog, are like the two nations. It calls them the chief prince. That term sort of indicates to me that it's spiritual in nature. A prince in the Bible generally is a spirit like a principality that Paul mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6. And so we have Gog and Magog, the chief prince of Meshach. We have a spiritual connection here. And in somehow, some way, in fact, I'm going to read to you uh, this is from the Wikipedia article on Gog and Magog. Uh, it says, The Lord Mayor's account of Gog and Magog says that the Roman Emperor Diocletian had 33 wicked daughters. Stop right here. 33. We're going we're gonna to see that number here in a little bit. I think it's interesting. He had 33 daughters. He found 33 husbands for them to curb their wicked ways. They chafed at this, and under the leadership of the eldest sister, Alba, they murdered their husbands. For this crime, they were set adrift at sea. Now, stop right here, because I want you to think of a story that relates to a boat on water. Okay, uh, Remember when we were talking about uh, the Easter egg and someone were talking about Isis and how she is reassembling the broken body of Osiris. There was, there was something about Osiris' body being placed in a casket and floating down water. So I think this is a connection here. Think about it. Uh, for this crime, they were set adrift at sea. They washed ashore on a windswept island, which they named Albion, which now is the land of England, after Alba. Here they coupled with demons. Okay, stop right here. Here they coupled with demons. So we have these women, these 33 evil, wicked women, and they are mating with, with gods, with devils, and gave birth to a race of giants whose descendants included Gog and Magog. So, I mean, we're, we're seeing sort of a connection here um, uh, with the giants and, and spiritual entities. Now, I won't get that far into this study probably in this video. I am going to go deal with that in the next, in the conclusion of this. But we're going to deal primarily with this idea of giants. Where did they come from? Because if you, <clears throat> we have noted this before, if you look in all of, uh, all of human history, practically every culture, every society in the world has like three stories that are common. They all have, they all have dragon stories, every one of them. Every culture in the world has a story about dragons roaming the earth. And the, you know, the anthropologists and the scientists say, that's, uh, that's just myth and legend. They saw something and they exploded it, made it real big, and turned it into this dragon creature. Well, could be, except that the Bible mentions dragons. It calls them by different names like Leviathan, fiery flying serpent. I want you to remember that. We're going to see that again today. Uh, and so on. And so the Bible mentions things called dragons. Incidentally, the devil is referred to over and over in the scriptures as the dragon. Every culture in the world, along with having dragon stories, and dragons could be probably linked with dinosaurs, Every culture in the world has uh, a flood story. The Sumerians have a flood story. Babylonians have a flood story. The Mayans had a flood story. The American Indians had a flood story. The Greeks had a flood story. They have the story of Atlantis is the story of the flood. The story of Atlantis is the story of an advanced 
civilization ruled over by ten gods, think about that, uh, with one demigod as their leader. Think a, a demigod is, according to mythology, a half-human and a half-god. They're made it together somehow and produced this demigod. Now that's all myth and legend. But the whole story of Atlantis is about an advanced civilization that existed and was covered over by a flood. Well, that matches almost perfectly the story of the scriptures where God said that he was done, he was tired of what was going on in the earth, and he was going to destroy the earth by water, and he saved a remnant. That man was Noah and his generations. We are of, according to the scriptures, we are all the descendants of Noah through his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, all the, all the cultures of the world, all the stories, they have a story of, uh, of dragons. The Bible happens to mention that they're real. There's a story of the flood. Somehow, someway, and the Bible will give you the accurate account of them. And then, all of the myths, all the legends, all the stories, all the tall tales. I forgot Paul Bunyan. You see, even America has a myth or a legend of of a giant, and, and those of you who live in different places in the world, you don't know about Paul Bunyan. We grew up in school reading stories about Paul Bunyan. He was this giant woodsman. He could take an axe and chop a tree down with one swing. He, had a, he, he didn't ride a horse. He rode an animal that they called Babe the Blue Ox, and that's how he got around. That's, that was the story of Paul Bunyan. See, even an American has a giant. Now, that's, that's myth. That's mythology. That is um, tales that were told from one generation to the other. And I wouldn't pay attention to that, and I normally don't, except for that little pesky thing in the Bible where it just constantly mentions the word Giants. Now, when I say the Bible, I'm saying the King James. Um, I'll give you a little piece of information here at the beginning. And we're just going to pocket that information for now. And um, we're going to probably bring it up, probably not in this teaching, but some others. I just happened to be looking as I started studying this out. Of course, I went through, and what we're going to do in this is we're going to talk about every place in the King James Bible that I could find, and I might have missed some, every place in the Bible that refers to giants or these people of, of abnormally tall stature, which is why the King James Bible translated, there's actually three Hebrew words, why the King James Bible translated all three of these words into one conglomerate word, which was the word giant, because that's what they were. That's exactly what they were, and you'll see that as we go along. Something that I found very, very interesting, if you remember the video um, that we did called The Modern Translations of the Bible in the Spirit of Antichrist, I, I showed you that the, the modern Bibles nowadays, they, they tend to, it looks like they're trying to cover something up. Uh, for instance, um, the two places in the King James Bible that says this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, talking about stubborn devils that won't leave. You go into prayer and fasting and they'll leave. They can't handle that for some reason. The NIV has taken both of those verses out. I wonder why. The NIV exchanges the name Lucifer for something other than that. It actually calls Lucifer the morning star. Well, that's Jesus. That's wrong. That instead of him, instead of the Antichrist being the man of sin, he's the man of lawlessness. lawlessness. Instead, of, instead of the mark going in the right hand or in the forehead, now the mark is on the right hand. That's, I think that's significant. <clears throat> and I was looking through the NIV and I noticed that when I looked for the word giant, it's not there. The word giant does not exist. In the New International Version of the Bible, why? Why isn't it there? Well, <clears throat> we may hold off on that part until the next video that we do on this subject. But let's deal with what my old friend the King James Bible says. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 6. This is actually the first place in the Bible that the Bible mentions, the King James Bible mentions the word giants. Now, we're going to be in, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And here's what, now, Genesis chapter 6, in case you don't know your Bible chronology. In Genesis chapter 7, this is when God destroyed the entire world. The entire earth, all the earth landmass covered up. 
That's what the Bible says uh, with water. So in Genesis chapter 6, there is a description of the earth prior to the flood. God is actually describing for us what it was like the spiritual condition of it, God said that they, they're, they're, all their thoughts and their imaginations are wicked totally. And I just can't, uh, they're beyond saving. Well, that's something interesting. When God who is all powerful, God who gives man free will, when God looks at mankind and says, you're beyond saving, that's, that's pretty bad. And that's apparently how they had gotten. Remember, Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Are we approaching those get days again today? I think we are. I think we're living in, on borrowed time right now. And God is going to do something tremendous in these last days. But we have in Genesis 6 a description of the earth, a description of, um, of the culture, the people, and so on. And then we have a description in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Here's what the Bible says. There were giants in the earth in those days. Now, let's stop right here. Let's break this down piece by piece. It says there were giants in the earth in those days. And so now, <clears throat> I want you to think about this. This is Moses writing the book of Genesis. And he is describing exactly what went on. He's been given inspiration by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so here is Moses, and he's writing a historical record he believes that he, and he knows that he's being led by the Spirit, and he knows that accuracy is important. So he writes, there were giants in the earth in those days. Now he's describing the days before the flood, um, because the, in verse 3 of Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be in 120 years. And so God had started 120 years before the flood. He had started a clock ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. The clock was winding down. God was going to destroy the earth. And Moses was telling you that before the flood, there was giants in the earth in those days. But then he says, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bear children to them. The same became mighty men of old, men of renown. Now, we're not going to deal with, in this particular video, we're not going to deal with the sons of God, daughters of men issue. We're going to deal with that uh, in the next one. Well, let's just deal with these giants. Let's find out. Actually, as I'm doing this study, I realize that giants were all over the place in the, in the histories of the Old Testament. They were practically everywhere and we'll see that. So we have the Bible describing for us that number one, before the flood, there were giants in the earth. Number two, after the flood, let me explain this. Noah, his three sons, and their wives, and Noah's wife, the eight people, they are the only ones who came off of the earth. They are the only human beings. They are the only, only living flesh that survived along with the animals that Noah saved. So it's like God starting all over again with Noah and his, and his sons and their wives. And then they began to, if you look in Genesis chapter 10, you'll see all the nations that descended from Noah and those three sons. They're enumerated here in Genesis chapter 10. And so God, whatever giants there was before the flood, they were all wiped away by the flood. They don't exist as of the flood. Then after the flood, the Bible says, also after that, after the flood, um, the same, the giants, the same, became mighty men of old, mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Now, <clears throat> that's an interesting phrase, and I think as we go along, I'm going to use that phrase again, because I think that's the Bible's way of telling us, yeah, there's going to be stories all throughout history about giants, about giant creatures, about giant men, and the Bible is telling you this is who they are. So, uh, Moses, we mentioned Moses writing uh, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and Noah was writing before the flood of the giants. Actually, Moses had first-hand knowledge of these giants because they were in the earth before the flood. And then they were in the earth after the flood. Moses actually encountered 
two of their kings. We're going to see that here in a little bit. So let's go to after the flood. Let's go to the scripture. Let's find out the first, one of the first places that the Bible describes uh, the giants after the flood. Genesis chapter 14. Uh, this would be about the time of Abraham and Job. Abraham is living in the time of Genesis 14. In fact, Abram is mentioned in Genesis 14 as having rescued Lot at this same time period. Lot who lived in Sodom at the time. Sodom was the well-watered plains of Sodom. Okay, And so Abraham lived at this time. And according to what we can find out from Scripture, Job also lived... During this time, did you know that Job mentioned giants too? We'll, we'll see that here in a little bit. But anyway, so we have in Genesis chapter 14, here's what the Bible says. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now, I want to stop right here. Let me, let me kind of tell you the research that I've been doing this week. Um, I started looking at the Bible, started looking at the roots of what the Bible was talking about when it referred to giants. I noticed there were three Hebrew words uh, that were always translated as giants in the Old Testament. Uh, the first one was called the nafal, okay? And that word simply means to fall, okay? We'll explain that a little bit later on. And then we have the Hebrew word rafa, okay? And then we have the Hebrew word gibor. Now, again, in the King James Bible, Almost always, these words are translated as giants, except when it's going to speak of like the Rephaim. It's actually going to name a tribe of people called the Rephaim. They were all, and the Bible tells you that these people were giants. Now, it's interesting when we look at the name Amraphel. It looks to me, and if you get a Strong's Concordance, you can see these names have similar, similar roots. The name Am Raphael has the name Rafa or the word Rafa in it. Is it possible? And I'm just kind of speculating here. Is it possible that the king of Shinar was a Rephaim. Is it possible? We know when we get later on, we'll see in Genesis 14, that these giants actually existed at this particular time. So is it possible that Am Raphael was named this because he was of the Raphaim or the, the giants that occurred after the flood? We notice that he is the king of Shinar, which is, that brings us to an interesting point. We have the first king of the land of Shinar whose name is Nimrod. Now, is it possible, just throwing out a guess here, that Amraphel and Nimrod are the same people? I don't know that, okay? I don't know that. But let's look at Nimrod for a minute. Let's look at what the Bible says about Nimrod. We have Nimrod who was, uh, who was the king of Babylon. He actually, he was, he was the king in Shinar, and he built four cities. We'll see that. Let's go to the scriptures. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. The Bible says, Cush... Cush, let me stop right here. Cush was the son of Ham. Ham was the son of Noah. So we have Cush, he begat Nimrod. And he, watch, look at what the Bible says. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now let's stop right here. Let's do some comparing here. Okay? And I, I have made up my mind that I'm going to go slowly in this, uh, in this discussion because I want to deal with this thoroughly. I want to deal with it fairly. I think there is a lot of information the Bible has to yield up to us to give us understanding not only of what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. And, and remember, I think that's crucial. I think as Bible believers, as people who say that we want to go to heaven, we're actually saying, God, we believe you for the future. I think those who say to God, we believe you for the future, we need to believe God for the past. And I think God is going to tell us some things here. So we have, um, we have Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. And notice back in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says that these giants, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So the Bible said the word became and began sort of have the same idea. He began, Genesis chapter 10, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Now, is the Bible alluding to the fact that Nimrod could very well have been a, a giant? Well, I'll tell you that if you research Nimrod in, in mythology, if you research Nimrod and all of the extra biblical accounts about him, 
they'll tell you that he was a giant. Now, I don't accept those as being authoritative, but I accept what the Bible says. And the Bible sort of gives us the idea that it's possible that Nimrod was a giant. We see another witness uh, back, in, uh, back in Genesis 14 of a man by the name of Amraphel, who was the king of Shinar. That's who Nimrod was. He was the king of Shinar. Let's look at it again. Uh, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. So that's the Sumerian account of the giants and how they came about. Sumeria is Shinar. And so certainly we have a connection with the stories of Samaria or the mythology of Samaria and the biblical account of the land of Shinar. You look at verse 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and built Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kela and Rezin between Nineveh and, Ke uh, the, and Kela, the same as a great city. Verse 13, And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lehabim and Naphtuhim and Pathrusim and Kazluhim, out of whom came Philistim and Kaphtorim. Now I want you to notice that I have out of whom came Philistine underlined. Philist the Philistines were the close cousins of Nimrod. And what we're going to see is that the Philistines and the giants, they were always buddies. Okay, You'll always see where you see the Philistines, you see the giants. That, I think, is very, very important. The Bible is going out of its way to give you this piece of information. And I think it's for a reason. Now, when I study the biblical account of Nimrod, here I find something interesting. I noted that from Adam, counting down from Adam, you have from Adam to Noah, you have Noah's the tenth generation from Adam. Noah's son Ham would be the eleventh, Cush would be the twelfth. Nimrod is the thirteenth descendant from Adam. Now, let me just kind of tell you very quickly where I go with this. Revelation chapter 13, you can look at Deuteronomy 13, you can look at Acts chapter 13. You see all these 13s in the Bible, and it gives you an indication of a particular person. In Acts chapter 13, it talks about a guy by the name of false prophet who Paul calls the child of the devil. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, we're warned about a false prophet who leads people to worship other gods and their images. In Revelation chapter 13, we have the Antichrist, the beast rising up out of the sea, and the false prophet causes everyone to worship him. I think Nimrod and his thir being 13 in line shows a connection between the story of Nimrod and the accounts of the beast or the Antichrist in the last days. He is, he is, the, he is noted, Nimrod is noted as the sixth son of of Cush. Cush had five sons. The sixth son that Cush had was a man by the name of Nimrod. When I look at the number six, of course, I go back to Revelation 13, and his number shall be 300 or 600, three score and six. I look also to a pattern of sixes that God lays throughout the Bible. Let's skip ahead just for a second. Goliath was a giant. He, had, he was six cubits tall. Spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. His brother had six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. These sixes always keep showing up with these giants. Nimrod being the sixth son of Cush. And, uh, of course, when we look at Genesis chapter 6, that's the first account of, of the giants or the mighty ones, the mighty men of old, the men of renown. Now, something that is interesting to me about Nimrod, something that we know from the historical record of the scripture, is that Nimrod was a builder. Okay, He was a king, but he was a builder. It was, I believe, during his days, you go from, he is mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 to Genesis chapter 11. In the days of Nimrod, this is when they're building a great, big, gigantic, huge, large pyramid. It was in a different form, probably a ziggurat, but it was a pyramid nonetheless. And so I, I'm trying to establish something in your mind that it looks like to me that Nimrod was a builder 
of pyramids. So we have, I want you to follow me, and we're going to see this again. Every place in the world has a story about dragons. Every place in the world has a story about the flood. Every place in the world has a story about giants. And they all built pyramids everywhere. We'll see that here in just a little bit. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 14. Okay, and I'm I'm going to warn you right now. You want to, if, as you watch this DV, you will probably want to take notes. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to take notes on the scriptures that I'm using. Go back and do your own study in the King James Bible to see whether these things. I want you to be a Berean on this. All right. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 14. We have Amraphel, the king of Shinar. We have Keter Leomer, who is in a, con in a confederacy with uh, these other kings. And so in Genesis 14, verse 5, the Bible says, In the 14th year of Keter Leomer and the kings that were with him, they smote the Rephaims, there's that word, Repha, Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Kirnaim, the Zuzims in Ham, the Emims in Shabbat, Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now, we look at this verse again here very quickly. We have Keter Leomer and the kings that are with him, and they smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth. Remember, when, remember we were talking about Isis, the goddess, okay, the Easter egg. Remember that. One of the forms of Isis is Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth was a city named after a particular goddess. And I will tell you that there is a connection between the giants and the worship of the feminine deity or the fertility goddess. There is a connection there. So here we have, and these are actually words that the Bible will tell you. The Rephaims, the Zuzims, and the Emims, and the Horites, the Bible is going to tell you later that every one of these civilizations were giants. The Bible is going to tell you specifically. So here we have, right after the story of the flood, in the days of Abraham and probably Job, we already have what the Bible says happened, what Moses said happened after the flood. This event occurred and these giants now are wandering the earth again in Genesis chapter 14. Now, here is the next encounter. Here is now we're going to have we're going to skip forward to the days of Israel. Israel is in the land of Egypt. They're in the land of bondage and they they're going to leave there and they're going to make their 40-year journey into the promised land. Well, they've got uh, they've got a, as we say in America, they've got a tough row to hoe. They have a long way to go, and they're going to have a tough battle getting into the land of promise. And that tough battle has everything to do with Israel's encounters with the giants. Okay, And I mean giant, tall, human, big, huge, large people. This is who Israel encountered in the wilderness. And every, every theology, every doctrine that is based, and we're going to connect it here in a little bit, every ideology from the Bible that is connected with the wilderness story of the Israelites going around in circles for 40 years and being proven and tried and tested in the wilderness and finally getting into the promised land and then fighting wars in the promised land to take over that land, every bit of it, has to do with giants. We cannot, we cannot take the stories of these giants out of the equation and get understand. We can't do it. They're all there. Look what I might look what I mean. Numbers chapter 13, verse 21. The Bible says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, as men came to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahimon, I want you to notice that word there, Ahimon. Okay? This is, we're going to find out now that Ahiman is in the land of the giants. Okay? So, where Amehan, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Stop right here. We're going to find out later that the children of Anak, Anak was a giant. His children, his offspring, were giants. It's interesting that when George Lucas wrote the, the saga, the mythology of Star Wars, that the guy who, who ends up being Darth Vader, he was born as a little boy uh, under very, very special circumstances. He was like born of a virgin. Darth Vader's name was 
Anakin. Okay? I don't think that's I don't think that's a coincidence. Anyway, so we have the children of Anak. Those children were named Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai. I'm sure to remember Ahiman again. Then the Bible says, Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Verse 23. And they came into the brook of Eshkol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff. Stop right here. Not only when the Israelites are going into the wilderness, not only do they see giant tall men. We're going to see it from the scriptures. But here, they cut down. They're, they're being sent in to look at the fruit of the land. And for some reason, when they cut down one cluster of grapes, apparently the Bible's telling you that it was so large that two guys were having to carry it together on their shoulders on a pole. They, they hung it from a pole and two guys, it took two men. Now, you stop and think about it. You would never in a million years imagine that two grown men with a pole on their shoulders were carrying a little bitty cluster of grapes. Okay? Look at what it says again. They came into the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes where the children of Israel cut down from hence, from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. Now I want to go back to this word Ahiman. Okay? Ahiman. When I saw that, I recognized that word. I'm gonna, I want you to remember that Ahiman was of the giants. He was the son of Anak. Okay? Let's look, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to put in another word here, and then I'm going to, I'm going to kind of draw a conclusion here. I'm going to show you. First Kings chapter 11, verse 23. Here's what the Bible says. And God stirred up another adversary. I want you to look at this adversary's name. His name was Rezon, the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord Hadadezer, the king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band. When David slew them of Zobah, they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was, he, this person Rezon, or Rezon, was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. Now the Bible does not tell you that Rezon was a giant, but we know that giants lived in these days. But let's stick with what we do know. We have a man by the name of Ahiman. He was a giant. He was a son of Anak. We have a man by the name of Rezon, who is listed as a fierce adversary of the children of Israel. So here we have an adversary named Ahiman, who's an adversary of the children of Israel. We have another guy in the name of, in the days of David, who is an adversary of Israel. His name is Rezon. Why am I going like out of my way to tell you all this nonsense information that seemingly doesn't mean anything? Somebody a few years ago handed me a book. Okay, they said, Pastor Mike, hang on to this. It was a Constitution manual for Freemasonry. And it had a funny name to it. I never could figure out what that name was. This is Morals and Dogma here. I never could figure out what that name was. And then I just happened to read it in the Bible. It's a book called, that Masons call the Ahiman Rezon. Two names out of the Bible. Both of them hated Israel's guts. They hated, wanted them dead. Wanted to kill them. The adversaries of Israel were two guys, one named Ahiman, who was a giant, another guy named Rezon. And for some reason, Freemasons, and this, this book has been around 300 years, 200, 300 years. Okay? This is what they call their constitution book on, on how they do their, their orders, how they, how they organize their lodges and so on. And it's called the Ahiman Rezon, and they say, it's a big secret. We can't tell anybody why we call it this. Well, maybe it's in the Bible. I just think that's interesting. We're going to see another connection okay, between the giants and, and these Mason brotherhoods here. Numbers chapter 13, verse 28. Let's get a little bit more information about these giants. So we have the Israelites. They sent 12 spies in. They were there 40 days. They were looking around, and they were saying, uh, Man, I, you know, boy, these guys are big, huge. Let's pick it up back in verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. 
the Amalekites. I want you to look at that. They're, they're, the spies are telling who's in this land. So number one, we know the grapes were huge. Okay. We also know, according to the scriptures, that the cities were walled. The Bible tells you that they were walled up to the heaven. They were humongous fortresses. Because if you think about it, giant people need giant food and they need giant places to live. Okay? Just think about that. So we have the cities are walled and they're very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And then we saw the Amalekites. I want you to remember that word. And the dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites. I want you to remember that. Dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Now, here's something that I found out here a while back. I was just kind of doing some study on the word angel in the Bible. Okay? And I noted that it, the Hebrew word for angel was malak. Okay? Which means you go look it up. The Hebrew, the, one of the Hebrew words for angel is malak. And here we have the amalak kites. Okay? That word is also related to like a, a king or a prince. Remember principalities, princes, uh, Gog and Magog are princes. They're spiritual entities, they're angels, and they're princes. So the word makes sense. Is there a connection between the Amalekites and the word angel? I think there is, because the Israelites, and you're going to see this, okay? One of the things that the giants did was they left their religion. And part of the religious practice was that the children of Israel ended up burning their children in the fire to a god named Molek, Malak, angel, Amalekites, and Molek. I think there's a spiritual connection here. Molek was a god. He was a fallen angel. who he was. Okay, And this is who they were worshiping. And is it possible that the Amalekites were also of this same order of giants? We know the, we, we know the Anakim were there, the Rephims, and so on. So we know that there's we know that the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, was infested with giants everywhere. Let's keep reading. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. Here's what happened. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Stop right here. Caleb and Joshua, when they went in, they were two, they were two of the twelve spies that went in. They come back and they said, God said that we could take these cities. God said we could. Why don't we just go in and take the cities and we can have the land and we can be at rest. We can stop journeying, stop wandering. We've been out here for a year. Why don't we just go and take this land? God said we could. I don't know how we're going to do it, but God said we could. Okay? So look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. Now let's stop right here. This is why the King James Bible is translating these words, Rapha or Naphal or Gibor. This is why the King James Bible is translating them as Giants. It's giving you, and the word giant is giving you the accurate description of who these people are. Okay? In verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Grasshoppers this big, a man's this big, and the guys were saying, that's who we were to them. That's how small we were compared to them. So these people must have been huge. The Bi I'm, a I'm asking you, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible for your future, which hasn't happened yet? Then you must believe the Bible for what it says about the past. And the whole reason, I mean, the, this, the spies didn't come in and say, you know what? Um, the, there's no watering holes, the, the land is barren, there's no way we're going to be able to plant crops in there. We don't like the politics of the people, we don't like anything about them, Let's do, that stinks. So it, they didn't say that. The only reason why the ten spies who come back, the only reason why they say we can't go in there is because of the giants. They're so 
huge. The sons of Anak, men of great stature. We went and spied the land. They're everywhere. We can't go in there. Now, did you know that New Testament doctrine, the doctrine of the salvation of the Gentiles and the fact that God took Israel and said, uh, I'm done with you for a while. That whole doctrine, you know what it's based on? It's based upon the fact that these were giants. Now, if you say, I don't believe the Bible, and I don't believe this word giants, I don't believe they were that big, I, I think the Bible's stretching it, I think that, you know, I, I think the testimony got out of whack over the years, I think men, but, uh, if you think all of that, then tell Paul he's a liar, because Paul based an entire doctrine upon these giants. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10, wherefore, this is what Paul said in Hebrews, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I sweared my wrath. They shall not enter into my rest. Take heed brethren. Look at this. Look at this. Take heed brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He says in verse 15 of Hebrews 3, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, they did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in into unbelief. Paul is basing the entire doctrine of salvation based upon faith, based upon belief in what God said. He's basing that entire doctrine upon a story that most theologians and scholars say it probably didn't happen that way. What does that make our foundation stand on then? You see, it's just, it's just easier to believe the Bible and believe every story and every word and believe it exactly the way it is. That the land of Israel was so infested with these sons of Anak and these Zuzims and these Emims and these Horites and everybody. They were everywhere and probably the Amalekites Definitely the Amorites. The land was so infested with them that ten of those spies came back and said, we, we can't do that. Even though God told them they could. Even though God had told them since Abraham, God had told them that that was going to be their land. For 400 years since Abraham, those people had heard that that was going to be their land. They go in and they look at it and they say, we can't have it. And Paul based the entire doctrine on whether or not you can go to heaven and enter into your rest. He based his entire doctrine upon this story right here. It's called the provocation. The men of Israel decided to believe the ten spies and they said, we're not going in there. You know what, you know what God said? Fine, you're not. You know what God did? He made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. How many days were they in there? They were in there 40 days. God made them wander a year for a day, 40 years in the wilderness. You know why? Because that generation that said, we can't go in there, God said, fine, you're not going in there. And they died. Their carcasses are still in the wilderness. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, and the offspring of the Israelites that came out of Egypt, they are the only ones who got to go into that land. What, for one reason only. Those men in those cities were so huge and so big, and those cities, those walls were so high, the Israelites said, we, we can't fight them, we'll lose. There's no way we can do that. So I want you to remember that this, this is how important that I think that this is. Uh, the Bible gives us other words. We mentioned the Emims, the Horems, or the Horites, and the Avims. We'll talk about those as we move along. Now we move to Deuteronomy chapter 9, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 9. Here's what the Bible says And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given R unto them, uh, uh, unto the children of Lot for a possession. Now in verse 10. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. So stop right here. So we have the Hebrew word Emim, 
which uh, I made a note somewhere. I think emim means like they're real ugly or something. I may be wrong on that. I have to get my notes back out. Um, but anyway, the emims dwelt there. The Bible is describing them that, number one, they are great people. Number two, there's many of them. And we're not just talking about one or two. We're talking about the, they, were covered, they covered the land everywhere. And they were tall. How tall were they? They were as tall as the Anakims. Verse 11, which were also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. So we have two different names. We have the, we have the, the, uh, we have the Anakims and we have the Emims, but they were sort of one and the same people. Verse uh, 12, the Horims. Remember, when uh, Keto Laomer went back in, in Genesis 14 and he smote the Emims and the Zuzims, the Bible says he smote the Horites as well. So here we have the Horims, same people. The Horims also dwelt in Mount in Seir before time. That's exactly what Genesis 14 says. But the children of Esau succeeded them. And when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto them in unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. If we look back and connect verse 12 with verses 10 and 11, we see the Emims, the Anakims, and the Horims. They were all giants. They were giant races that inhabited that land. Then we look in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 19. Here's what the Bible says. When thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon. Ammon, if you remember, Ammon was a descendant of Lot with one of his daughters. Ugh. Okay, Ugh. that's just uh, Ammon and Moab, the Moabites and the Ammonites. They were the two sons where Lot lay with his daughters. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so we have the children of Ammon. The, by, God said, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession. Because I have given it unto the children of Lot for possession, that also was accounted a, I want you to notice this phrase, a land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumims. That is the Zumims that was referred to in Genesis chapter 14. So we have the Emims, the Horites, the Avims, the Zamzumims. Verse 21, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. Verse 22, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even to this day, and the Avims, which dwelt in Hazarim, even unto Aza, the Kaphtarims, which came forth of Kaphtor, destroyed them and dwelt in their stead. So we have what I think the Bible's telling us, a, a, a sort of, he's naming these, these tribes of the giants. Again, we have, uh, we have the Emims, we have the Zamzuzims, Zamzumims, it's easy for you to say. We have the Anakims, we have um, the, uh, we, we have the Avims. And all of these dwelt in that land. They were all remnants of the giants. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting. Okay? I like, I, if, you've not, if you've been bored so far, and remember, we're learning from the Bible just how important it is not to bypass in our theological discussions the idea that the whole reason for the Israelites not believing God was because of the giants. Okay, uh, fear. What is the devil's number one tool against anybody? It's fear. Put fear in people. Okay, um, we're learning things. We're learning things. Probably, if if you have not studied this, you probably did not know this, but it's right there, right there in the King James Bible for you to read. Okay, so we have these people, and they are all over in the land of Canaan. Okay, now. Um, God wants the Israelites and, um, and his people, to. he wants the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan. On their journey to get to the land of Canaan, they encounter the giants. They're going to have to deal with them. We're going to see that in a minute. Um, once they get across Jordan into the promised land, then they've got to deal with them again. Okay, So think about that. Think about, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They had to deal with them once. They crossed Jordan. Now they've got to deal with them again. That's the biblical pattern that God lays out in the Scripture, that that which was 
is that which shall be. You say, Pastor Mike, are you saying that we're going to have to deal fight giants again like David? I don't know that. But I will tell you that there's something about these giants, probably something we'll discuss in the next video. There's something about these giants that I believe, yes, absolutely, God's going to have to deal with again in the last days. Let's look at some prophetic history. I like this. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. Here we have Og, the king of Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. So we have the Og being identified as a giant. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Raboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits was the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. And this land which we possessed at that time from Aror, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites. Verse 13, And the rest of Gilead and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, and all the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants. There's that word again. I want you to remember that, the land of the giants. There used to be a TV show. Back in the 60s, I think, called The Land of the Giants. That was so fascinating to me. Okay? Uh, they got it from the Bible. Okay? Anyway, the land of the giants. There's that term again, and we're going to remember that. We're going to see something, I think, very, very important in this study. Okay? The land of the giants. So, we have Og the king of Bash. And notice that the Bible says his bed. His bed was made of iron. Okay? We have iron. Iron always shows up with these giants, by the way. Goliath. A uh, spearhead, 600 shekels of iron and so on. Og lays on a bed of iron. That's got to be like the most uncomfortable thing in the whole world to lay on. But it's made out of iron. And notice how big it is. Nine cubits was the length thereof, four cubits the breadth of it. And notice the Bible is telling you that it's after the cubit of man. The Bible's not going to leave you any leeway here. Okay? On how big this was. Do you believe the scriptures? I am... Uh, I wouldn't say I was a normal size man. I'm about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, something like that. Um, my cubit, from the tip of my elbow to the tip of my finger, is roughly 18 inches. Okay, so And that's kind of what you're going to get. 17, 8 inches in some cases. Somewhere around in there. Okay, Give or take a few inches. I did the math. Okay, I did the math. Nine cubits turns out to be 13 feet 6 inches. That's how long his bed was. Now, let's say the bed was just a little bit longer than he was. I personally do not have a need to sleep in a bed that's 13 and a half feet long. I, I don't need it. Okay? Uh, six and a half feet's fine enough for me. 13 and a half feet long, six feet wide. Okay? So this is not just a tall, skinny fellow. He's huge. He is large everywhere. According to, the, according to this measurement, this is what the Bible says. Uh, I'm going to give you a graphic here. 13 and a half feet. That is more than the size of two average men standing on one another's, one standing on the other's shoulders or on their head. Okay? That's how big his bed was. This is Og, the king of the giants. Do you believe the Bible and what it says. I think you should. Okay. Now, in Joshua chapter twelve, this is where, this is where Albert Pike's going to show up on the scene. Okay. I'm going to put him right there. Okay. Joshua chapter twelve, verse one. Let's look at. And we we mentioned Og, who was a giant. Okay. Uh, God gave the Israelites a portion. It gave gave a portion of the Israelites his land. Okay. Now I want you to look at Joshua twelve, verse one. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side, uh, on the other side Jordan toward the rising of the sun, from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain on the east. Sihon, king of the Amorites, I want you to remember that, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Aror, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead, uh, even unto the river Jabbok, which is uh, the border of the children of Ammon. 
and from the plain to the sea of Chinneroth on the east, and unto the sea of the plain, even the salt sea on the east, the way of Beth Jeth Shemoth, and from the south under Ashdoth Pisgah, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, there he is again, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt in Ashtaroth and at Edri. I want you to remember that Og dwelt in Ashtaroth. There's Ashtaroth again. Okay? Boy, these giants, they really like her. Okay? There's a reason why. Anyway. Uh, verse 5, he reigned in Mount Hermon and in Salca and in all Bashan unto the border of the Geshurites and the Maacathites and half Gilead, the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. So we have Og and Sihon. Them did Moses, the servant of the Lord, the children of Israel, smite. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for possession unto the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So here we go. We have, watch this now, we have in this story here, we have Og as being mentioned as a giant, even telling us how big he is, 13, probably 13 feet tall. That's big. Okay. What about Sihon? I'm not look. I'm looking here in this passage, and I'm not finding that Sihon is uh, is a giant, but I got a sneaking suspicion that he is. So we search the scriptures, looking at Sihon and the Amorites. Look at what we find. Amos chapter 2, verse 9. And I'm going to stop right here. This is where the Bible is saying, here a little, there a little. You get your ideas from one part of Scripture and another part of Scripture. God puts them together and you go, oh, Sihon the Amorite was a giant. Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Sihon and the Amorites were giants. And you know what God said? I don't care how big they were. I destroyed them. I'm not afraid of them. Just like what he told Job about Leviathan. He said, Leviathan is like the most awesome, mean creature that you, you, if you'll fight him once and live through it, you'll never want to do it again. And God said, I made him. I'm not afraid of him. This is why God wanted the Israelites to go into the promised land. He wanted them to not fear. And he said, go on in there. I, I'm not afraid. I can destroy them. Just trust me. And the Israelites, they didn't trust God. They didn't believe. They didn't believe what he said. That sounds so much like modern Christianity today. Oh, it's the Bible. I don't. I don't really believe all that stuff. Definitely, definitely, the NIV here. Apparently, they have a problem with these being giants. They have a huge problem with that. Okay. Let's move on. Look at Deuteronomy chapter one, verse twenty-seven, concerning the Amorites. God said, And ye murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, they were giants, to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. There's another witness right there. The cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. So here's a, a second witness telling you that the Amorites were part of the giants just like the Anakims were. Okay, now, this story, back in Joshua chapter 12, I've referenced this before. You remember that? Because we have Moses, before they go into the promised land, and his people encountering Og and Sion, and according to scripture, both of them, and probably their people, were giants. Okay? Then in that same chapter, Joshua chapter 12, we find out that after Joshua goes into the promised land, he kills, he encounters and kills 31 more kings. A lot of them, according to scripture, were giants. Okay? So we have giants here in, in the wilderness. We have giants here in the promised land. There's two here and there's 31 here. What does that make? 33. That's this number right here. Okay, this number 33 that emblazons the front of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma and probably most uh, Freemasonic lodges everywhere. They have this same symbol, the 33rd degree right of Freemasonry. And I want you to notice, we're at order, ordo ad chaos, order out of chaos. You know what chaos is? It's the pit. That's what the word means. It means the bottomless pit, chaos. Ordo comes out of the pit. You remember the Greek myth of the giants? 
Remember how they said he got here? There was a god of the pit that mated with a woman and, and created the giants. Okay? And that number 33 sits on top of a crown here. Okay? I want you to think, and we've talked about this on numerous times before. It makes sense now, doesn't it? Okay? They encountered the giants and destroyed the giants before they go into the promised land. After they go into the promised land, they encountered the giants. Now, I want you to think about that. And there are 33 of them. Remember the 33 daughters in the myth of Gog and Magog? Now it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You see, these myths are simply the shredded remnants of the truth of the whole Bible. So now we're, we're starting to see that maybe these myths are actually based upon something that I believe to be real. Now I want you to get this. Speaking of this number 33 and the crown here, Okay, uh, forget about the double-headed eagle for a minute. We'll, we're going to reserve that later. Okay, think of the crown and the number 33 here. Think of someone who was 33 years old in the Bible. His name was Jesus. And what did he have on his head? A crown of thorns. I just remembered this. You know what God said? To the Israelites, when they went into the land of Canaan, he said, you go and you kill every one of those giants. Kill them all. Kill, I want them all out. That's not what they did. So in the book of Judges, and you know what God told the Israelites? They're going to be thorns. Go look at it. Okay? God said that the remnant of these people that you left, that you didn't kill, they're going to be thorns. Okay? It's all, all we're seeing a pattern now. It's all making sense here. Okay, so anyway, uh, back to the Amorites again. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. This is what God told Abram. He hasn't changed his name yet. He's still Abram. God is telling Abram. This is when God's making the covenant where he divided you know, everything in half. And, and he's telling Abram about what's going to happen in the future. He's giving him prophecy. And he said, Abram, about 400 years from now, your people are going to be in Egypt and they're going to go, I'm going to lead them back into this land and give it to them. He said, but he said, watch this, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. What did God mean by that? I'm only asking a question here. And does it have anything to do with the fact that the Amorites were giants? And God said the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not full yet. When I see things in the Bible that are come to fullness, we see in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God sent his son. So I think that there is going to be something that is going to come to full that is related to the iniquity of the Amorites. Remember, they were giants. Okay. Now, you're going to like this. Deuteronomy chapter 145, I just, once I figured out that the Amorites were giants, I went back and started looking at the Amorites again. Go back in scripture. You learn something, go back and restudy. Look at the Amorites, Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 44, and the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you, how? As bees do and destroyed you in Seir even unto Horma. Every time, the, I've, the, one of the most important, significant words in the whole Bible is the word as. As it was in the days of Noah. So, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three days. That word as, this is God's way of telling you this symbol means this symbol here. So, we have the Amorites, and God specifically said they're going to chase you as bees. I saw that and I went, I have seen this before. The Merovingian kings, you know who the Merovingians are, don't you? Uh, the whole Da Vinci Code thing, okay, was all about the Merovingian bloodline. Supposedly now, the Merovingian bloodline descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. That gave them the divine right to be what? Da 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 da, kings. Think about, think about this, okay? And a king that's coming out of a bloodline. Actually, the story of Merovingian, Mer King Merovay was, was that um, a Leviathan fathered him with an earthly woman. So King Merove represented like a, like a hybrid race. Now, I'm not going there in this study. Okay? I'm sticking right here with the description of the giants. 
But it's interesting that the symbol all throughout the Merovingian king's reign was the bee. That was their main symbol. Did you know that the bee and the hive is a prominent symbol in Freemasonry? Here you have Hermes Trismegistus holding a beehive with these bees here. Notice this Masonic apron. You have the square and the compass. Think about that, what it means. Uh, you have the, uh, the crossed swords. You have, um, oh, look here. You have Jacob and Boaz, the two pillars. You have a pentagram. And then look, you have a beehive with one, two, three, four, five, six bees flying around it. There's that number six again. Oh, Pastor Mike. There's something about the religion, the secret doctrine of Freemasonry that is now connected with the stories of the giants. Okay? And God said so. Let's go look in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's look at what the Bible says. <clears throat> when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. God's pretty serious about this. When you go into Canaan, you see all these giants everywhere. Don't marry their daughters. Don't let your daughters marry their son. We don't want them, their bloodline, their genetic, whatever it is that's making them that big. God said, I don't want it amongst my people. Don't do it. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 17. God said, Thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, there it is, the Amorites again, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that they teach you, watch this now, that they teach you not to do after all their abominations which they have done unto their God, so should ye sin against the Lord your God. God says two things. Number one, I'm going to let you move into their houses and you can eat from their land. That's fine. Don't marry their kids to your kids and destroy them all. Why? Because I don't want you knowing about their God. See, the giants had a religion. They had a religion. They worshipped Ashtaroth. They worshipped, we're going to find out later that they worshipped Dagon. Okay? And God said, I don't want you learning their religion. Utterly destroy every one of them. So look at what happens. Judges chapter 3. It's, it's kind of like when you have kids and you say, kids, I don't want you doing that. They're going to go right to it. Judges chapter 3, verse 5. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, and Perizzites, and Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took, look, there's the Amorites, and they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and did what? Served their gods. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and served, here, here it is, Balaam and the groves. The groves were the Asherah, the Ashtaroth places where they had flowers and pretty shrubs and trees and a goddess holding a little baby there. Okay, think about it. God said that was a religion. Think about, think about now the goddess holding the baby. Little statues. You drive up down any street in America, any town in America, and you're going to find somebody with a statue of a goddess holding a baby. Oh, no, that's the Virgin Mary and Jesus. God said don't do it. That was the religion of the giants. That's where it came. It was their religion. So now, watch this. Not only do we have, I, this is, you need to get this understanding, okay? God is not only basing Bible doctrine upon the fact that these giants lived. He's telling you that all the false, cultic, mystery religion practices that have gone on in the earth since the creation was the religion of the giants. And God said, don't learn their religion. So you know what the Israelites did? They learned it, mixed it in with, uh, with the Old Testament. They call it Kabbalah. Kabbalah is nothing more than the remnant religion of the giants.
And Kabbalah is all about how you, how you can become a god. Okay, that's what it's all about. Now, here's another interesting story concerning the Amorites. Joshua chapter 10, verse 5. Therefore, the five kings, let me stop right here, five kings of the Amorites. How many, how many brothers did Goliath have? He was Goliath, and he had four brothers. We'll see that. Goliath had four brothers. How many lords of the Philistines were there? Five. How many stones did David pick up? Five. Okay. Um, what trumpet is it that sounds... And the king of the bottomless pit, out of the K.O., the king that's in the K.O., Revelation 9-11, what trumpet sounds for how long? Five months. Fifth trumpet. There's a connection here. Okay? We have the five kings of the Amorites. The king of Jerusalem? Yes, yes. They were in Jerusalem. Jerusalem existed before the Israelites moved in there. Jerusalem was the land of the giants. You'll see it. The king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon gathered themselves together and went up, and they and all their hosts and encamped in Gibeon. Now, I'm going to stop right here. I have a little suspicion that the town Gibeon was named after Gibor, one of those Hebrew words for giant, okay? And encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. You remember this story, don't you? Look at Joshua chapter 10, verse 16. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. Stop right here. In Revelation chapter 5, there is a group of angels. I'm just giving you facts. In Revelation chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 9, there is a group of angels that are, that are locked up, sealed up. They're sealed up inside of a pit. A cave, a cave is a picture of the pit. They're sealed up in there. The fifth trumpet sounds, a star falls from heaven. How thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Five things that Lucifer represents. The pentagram, that's his symbol. The number five, they come down. The, the, the angel opens up the pit. They come out of the pit, okay? Um, and they do this for five months, and their king, who comes out of the K.O., the pit, comes out after them. This is why, I want you to look at the symbolism here. Here they take the five and lock them up in a cave. They got them hid there. Then look at Joshua chapter 10, verse 22. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave. Think of Revelation 9, the fifth trumpet sounding, and the pit now being opened. And bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. The king of Jerusalem, king of Hebron, king of Jarmuth, king of Lachish, the king of Eglon. Look at what happens. Look what he does. Joshua chapter 10 verse 24. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Stop right here. 1 Corinthians 15, where the story of the translation is, the prophecy of the translation, tells us that Christ must reign until he has put all of his enemies where? Under his feet. You know what Romans 16 says about the church? Paul said, may the God of heaven bruise Satan where? Under your feet shortly. This story here, they bring the five out, lay them on the ground, and these, these captains stand on their necks. They're under their feet. Now, look here how these giant kings were defeated. Look how they were defeated. Okay? Joshua 10, verse 26. And afterward, Joshua smote them and slew them and did what? Hanged them on five trees. Think about Christ, who had a crown of thorns on his head. He was pierced one, two, three, four, both feet, five times. And they hang him on a tree until the going down of the sun. Look at this. They hang him on five trees, and they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. That's exactly what happened with Christ. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun, and Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. The reason why God told the Israelites not to be afraid of these guys was he knew that his son, Jesus, was going to defeat them on the cross. They didn't have to be afraid. Neither do you and I. 
This, see, all these wonderful Bible doctrines, we've been missing it for years. They're all based upon these stories of giants. That's how real these characters were. God spends a majority of the Bible dealing with doctrines that are based upon the stories of the giants. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You remember that phrase, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Guess where it comes from? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that, uh, that were on the other side of the flood, think about that, or the gods of the Amorites, who were they? Giants. In whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I love it. I absolutely love it. When you start studying something in the Bible, God will just, it's all there. The giants were pivotal and crucial in our understanding now of New Testament doctrines. Okay? Uh, including the New Testament doctrine of hell. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe in hell? I do. I, I believe what the Bible says about hell. I believe what the King James Bible says about hell. I believe it's on fire. I believe it's real hot. Okay? I believe there's no water there. I believe it's a terrible, nasty, evil, dark, terrible place is what I believe. Now, uh, you know that I don't do a whole lot of Greek and Hebrew stuff. Okay? But those are the languages of the Bible. And you can't unknow some things. I happen to know that uh, the New Testament in the Greek uses certain words for hell. They're all translated in a common word, hell. And there's a reason for that. I'm not going to get into it today. But one of those is Tartarus. Okay? Well, think about that. Okay? Remember the story, the myth of Tartarus and Gaia birthing the giants. The pit, Kao. Okay? Uh, one of them is Hades. And one of them is Gehenna. Let me tell you where the word Gehenna comes from. Okay? Joshua chapter 15, verse 8. And the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom. That's where Gehenna comes from. Unto the south side of the Jebusite, the same as Jerusalem. And the border went up to the top of the mountain that lieth before the valley of Hinnom. There it is again, valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, which is at the end of the valley of the giants northward. Stop right here. Okay? In fact, I'm going to show you. We're going to pull up a map. Okay? Of Jerusalem. You can find this in the back of your Bible. Okay? Uh, the south part of Jerusalem is the Valley of Hinnom. Okay? That land, according, according to Joshua 15.8, let's look at, uh, for another witness here, uh, Joshua 18, 16, the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is in the valley of the giants in the north. Jerusalem used to, remember, the, the Amorites, they used to own Jerusalem. That was their town. The, the land where the giants lived, the land where the giants lived, where they practiced their religion, was in the valley of the son of Hinnom. What religious practice did they do? in the valley of the son of Hinnom. They did multiple ones. Look at 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 25. You remember Ahab? Okay. There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So, number one, Ahab follows the religion of the Amorites. The religion of the Amorites is... They built, they made idols, okay? Now, if the Amorites were giants, what the Bible tells us they are, okay, these idols would have been huge because everything they had and everything they did, everything they were associated with was huge. It was large, okay? And then again in Joshua eighteen sixteen, the valley of the son of Hinnom was the valley of the giants north. Now, something about this valley, this is where the, the giants practiced their religion. It must have been a sort of like a magical place to them. And in the occult world, in the occult world, certain locations have certain magic powers to it. I don't understand all of that yet. 
but just certain places all over the earth, these spirits seem to gather in places. And the giants had this land of the giants, the Valley of Hinnom, where they practiced their religion. Okay? This, if you go back to Nimrod, if, if Nimrod was a giant, okay, which it could very well be, he began the whole Babylonian system. Remember how Jeremiah talked about the queen of heaven being an abomination? Guess where that came from? Nimrod. You remember in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8, where, there, where the women are weeping for Tammuz? Guess where that came from? Nimrod. That was his religion. The religion, it's the religion of the giants that has now extended and enveloped the entire earth. I'm going to show you this. Okay, If you have been going, oh, I wish we'd get out of the scripture. I'm going to show you pictures. You like pictures, don't you? I'm going to show you pictures here in a minute. Uh, let's connect something here. The Valley of the Son of Hinnom, land of the giants, where they were performing pagan practices. Valley of the Son of Hinnom. Son of Hinnom. Gehenna. In the New Testament, one of the places where the Greek word Gehenna is translated hell, Matthew chapter 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you, compass, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more, the child of hell, Gehenna, than yourselves. You know what Jesus is getting on to them for? All those religion practices that you learn from the land of the giants that you're still carrying forward right now, you're going to run out there and you're going to try to proselyze people with your false, phony, pagan, giant-infested, Astaroth-worshipping religion. And when you do, when you convert these people to your religion, now they're twofold, the child of hell. Think about it, okay? 2 Kings chapter 23. Here it is right here. We're going to connect some things. Uh, he defiled Topheth. I think this is uh, a hazy, I think. The Bible says he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter. Oh, no, this is, uh, this is uh, Josiah. Josiah, when he became king, he, he saw all these things going on. He said, uh -uh, I, 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 we're not going to have this. So he went and destroyed a place called Topheth, which was in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to, here he is, Malak, Molech, Amalekites, okay? The children of the giants, the giant people and their religion was, being, was still being practiced in the same place, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And when Josiah came in, he said, uh -uh, we're not doing this. We're not going to sacrifice our children anymore. Okay? Uh, here is a graphic of Molech. This is what somebody thinks he looked like. I don't know. I never saw him. Don't want to see him. But he is a spirit, a, a devil, an angel, Malak. That's who he is. Uh, here we have Second Chronicles chapter 28. Uh, we have the story of Ahaz. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. Look what he did. Verse 3. Moreover, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Stop right here. You know what burning incense represents? It represents prayers. He burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And I want you to understand this connection between Gehenna, the valley of the son of Hinnom, and fire. Fire, spirit like, like the pit, like hell fire. Hell is on fire. Okay? It's a different realm of fire. Not like the fire we see here. It's similar to that. But it's a different realm of fire. It is spirit realm fire. Is what it, that's what hell is. And they were practicing a religious practice by making their children pass through fire. You know what that was all about? It was about the idea that if, we, if something is in the fire, then something's going to resurrect out of that. Think of the phoenix. Think of the Antichrist. That's what that religion is all about. And that's the religion of the giants. Look in 2 Chronicles 33, the story of Manasseh. Look what he did. Uh, Manasseh built altars. Stop right here. Okay? Manasseh built altars. There was already an altar in the house of God. But Manasseh built, Manasseh built other altars. What were they? They were altars based upon the religion of the giants. Okay, verse 5, he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and he caused his children to pass through the fire, where? In the valley of the son of Hinnom, right in the land of the giants. Same place. 
He also observed times, used enchantments, used witchcraft, dealt with familiar spirit, wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Okay, and look what he did in verse 7. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made, in the house of God, which God said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Manasseh really tripped God's trigger. Not only is he following the religion of the giants by making his son pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Benham, the land of giants, the land of giants, not only is he doing witchcraft, but he built an idol, put it in the house of God. The giants were idol worshipers and they were idol builders. This um, witchcraft and wizardry, those are the familiar, those are the practices that God told the Israelites not to perform. When they got into it, he said, when you go, look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. Look what God said. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of who? Those nations. The giants. The giants were in there practicing. Look at this. You're not to make your son or daughter pass through fire. You're not to use divination, observe times, an enchanter, a witch, a charmer, consult with familiar spirits, wizard, or necromancer. God was, watch this. God was saying the giants in that land, they're practicing these religious practices. When you go into that land, don't learn their ways. We have dealt with, and I don't know how many Watchmen broadcasts, the number of occult practices that are going on, not only in the world, but in the church right now. Where do they come from? They were the religious practices of the giants. God warned us. God warned us. Uh, let's look at, here's something interesting here. You're going to like this. Okay, it's picture time. Joshua chapter 11, verse 21. And at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims. Remember, they're the giants. From the mountains, from Hebron, from Deborah, from Anab, and from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. Verse 22. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel. Almost. Only in Gaza, Gath, where was Goliath from, and Ashdod there remained. So in the cities of the Philistines, we have Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. The Bible's telling you that when Joshua would destroy the Anakims, they were all gone. Except in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. Okay? This is interesting. Remember the five kings of the Amorites and the, all this number five? The Philistines, you know how they designed their political slash religious organization? They had five kings, five lords. Same, listen, same, this idea, this number, this numerical system, this religious practice came from the giants. That's where it came from. That's why David picked up five stones to kill five brothers. Okay, Goliath and his four brothers. Okay, First um, Samuel chapter five. The Philistines took the Ark of God. Okay, they want the throne of God. They want that, and brought it from Ebenezer, where, and Ashdod. Who was living in Ashdod? The giants. Who was in control? The giants. Goliath was the champion of the army. He was the guy that called, you know what, he, he, he stands out in 1 Samuel 17, he's the guy that calls shots. He says, you send a guy out here to fight, here's what's going to happen. If he beats me, then all my guys are leaving. If I win, then I'm going to go, hey guys, and we're going to come in here and we're going to take you guys over. Goliath was in charge. The giants, wherever they were, they were kings. They were in charge. Who is it wanting the ark? The people who lived in Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it unto the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. You know this story here. We've read it several times. Dagon. Dagon. Guess who he is? Okay, Remember the Merovingians and the bees? The Merovingians, the myth of the Merovingians was that a sea creature mated with a human woman and, and the Merovingian kings were like the crossbreed, the hybrids between this sea, sea monster and a human woman. Now that's just mythology. That, uh, the, god of the, god, the god of the giants, the god of the Philistines, Dagon, was half 
sea creature, there it is, and half human. Here's another rendering of Dagon, or Oannes, O-A-N-N-E-S, Oannes. Okay, he goes by different names. Half, uh, half sea creature, half human. The stories of the mermaids and the mermen, what were they? Half human, half fish. Remember the story of the little mermaid and king, the king who was her father was half human, half sea creature. Okay? The priests of Dagon wore these little headdresses that looked like a fish with their mouth open. They were acting out the hybrid race. Now, if you go back in 1 Samuel chapter 5, you see that it was the priests of Dagon that ministered in the temple of Dagon. How did these priests of Dagon dress? Here is a representation right here. We have this graphic and we have another one. Shows the priests of Dagon wearing a head ornament that, that makes them look like they are half human and half, let's say, Leviathan. Let's say dragon. Half human, half dragon. Have you seen it before? Take a look. Uh, the exalted cardinals and the bishops of the Roman Catholic institution wear the exact same head garment. The whole religion of the Vatican. The whole religion. Number one, it's based upon idol worship. Number two, it worships the Queen of Heaven. Religion of the giants. Number three, their priests dress like the priest of Dagon, which was the god of the giants. Excuse me. The hybrid god of the giants. The religion of Rome is the religion of the giants. It's still, God said there is no new thing under the sun. That which was is that which shall be. And now you know where it comes from. This is how important this study is. Notice in Acts chapter 7 verse 43, the Bible says you took up the tabernacle of Moloch. The tabernacle of Moloch. Now, God had a tabernacle. He had a temple. It was a building. Okay? The pagans, the giants, also built, number one, we know that they build idols. Number two, we know that they built tabernacles of Moloch or Moloch in the land of the giants. Okay? We know that they were builders. Okay? Now, let's, let's look. It's picture time. I promised you it was going to be picture time. Let's go just for a few minutes around the world and see if we can see remnants of giant, giant people building giant, giant things that little people like us to this day can't figure out how to build them and how to move them. Easter Island. Look at there. What are these? You know what they are? They're idols. Okay? They're idols to gods. And they're protective idols. The whole island of Easter Island, which is outside of Chile, look at there. The whole island was covered with them. They were on the shores of nearly every shore on Easter Island. They were the barriers. They were the gods that were supposed to scare people off. Who built them? These things are so huge. I mean, we're not talking about these things are this tall. These things are so huge. If you think an uh, ancient man had the technology to both carve these out and move them great distances and erect them there to this extent, didn't happen. Who did? The giants. Stonehenge. You have these megalithic structures all over the world. These temples, tabernacles. Stonehenge. And by the way, these tabernacles are always oriented to have something to do with the equinoxes or the moon or the sun or the stars. They're always aligned in a certain way. And that's what Stonehenge is. These giant megalithic blocks that to this day people go there and they look at them and they go, man, these things are huge. How did they get those here? Nobody knows how they got them there. Who put them there? Well, if you believe the story of the scriptures, when the Israelites go in and they said, we were as grasshoppers, if that, if that is a ratio, if that is a ratio, then it's highly possible that people that big could have built structures like this. Here is a, uh, a, a temple. I can't remember where this is. But I want you to notice the giant blocks that are used to build this thing and the technology the technology that mankind has right now in all the ways that we can build stuff we cannot we cannot carve blocks of stone and put them in place like this those those uh, those moldings there are so tight 
and so neatly fitted together. And people go, how did this happen? I think the giants, they built big walls, they built big castles, they built big cities, they built temples, and they built idols everywhere. Now, let's get to this temple of Moloch, the tabernacle or temple of Moloch. Okay? Number one, we know that it's associated with sacrifice. Number two, we know that it's associated with the magical arts and, and the occult powers. Number three, we know that they were built in the land where giants once inhabited. We know that they were associated with fire. I want you to look at this picture of fire. This is actually what's called a funeral pyre. P-Y-R-E. A funeral pyre. This is from the religious practice now that says that it's a belief in the resurrection. The God that died and is in the fire will resurrect, like the phoenix. That's what that's all about. That's why they put their babies in here. Okay? Because they felt like it was going to give them resurrect or new life or resurrection powers. It was the powers of God being released. What, what building shape does this funeral pyre look like? Actually, I've been giving you the clue. It looks like a pyramid. Pyramid. Manley Hall says this about the pyramid. The, py the word pyramid is supposedly, is popularly supposed to be derived from the Greek word for fire. This signifying that it is the symbolic representation of the one divine flame. In other words, pyramids were basically temples or tabernacles of Moloch. Fire, the fire god, or, or the fires of hell. That's what they were. Here's what else he said. The initiates of old accepted the pyramid form as the ideal symbol of both the secret doctrine and those institutions established for its dissemination. Both pyramids and mounds are antitypes of the holy mountain or high place of God. It, right across the river here, over here, in Illinois, Cahokia, Illinois, is called the Cahokia Mounds. Even the American Indians were building pyramid-type structures or mounds where they perform sacrifices and worship their gods, their Molochs. Okay? It's the remnant of the giant religion is what it is. Okay? Notice Manly Hall refers to these pyramids as the high places. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Where? In high places. You see, again, the religion of the giants is essential in understanding the spiritual forces that are at work today that you and I as Bible believers are fighting against. And so the giants, they're all over the world. Every culture has a story about giants. Every one of them. Okay? And these giants apparently built buildings that today, us puny humans, cannot build. Okay? And most of them look like pyramids, fire, pyramids. You have the Pyramid of Giza. Nobody knows how it was built. Nobody can understand how it was built. You have the Pyramid of the Moon near Mexico City. On these pyramids over in, in South America, you know what they did on there? They did human sacrifices. Constantly, constantly, constantly. That's what these pyramids were for, was to do sacrifices. Even in Cambodia, pyramid structures. The Canary Islands of Spain, pyramid structures. Here's one in Algeria. Now that one looks like it was built by a person. Okay? Uh, it doesn't look as complex as the others. Here's a tomb in Korea. Pyramid structure. It's all about the God being resurrected from the fire. That's what these pyramids are all about. Look at the great pyramids in Egypt. You know what I found? I, I, this is so cool. I want you to look at this graphic here. Here we have the three great pyramids of Giza. Look right next to them there to the right. There's three little bitty ones. I never knew that. I looked at this and I went, oh, here's another picture of it. Three great big ones that nobody knows how they were built. And three little bitty ones that look like, you know, some people got together and built these three little ones. Think about it. The giants, an advanced race, and humans. Three of them built by giants. Three of them built by puny humans. Okay? Three and three makes, in the occult circles, makes the number 33 or the number six. Okay, you follow me? Um, look at the, if you think about the sides of these six pyramids, there's four on each pyramid. Four times six is 24. That represents the hours in a day. Manley Hall noted this. 
that on the pyramids themselves, you ha basically have, on one pyramid, you have four triangles, okay? So each pyramid represents a number, the number 12. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six pyramids equaling the number 72, okay? Um, let me jump forward here a little bit. On the $1 bill, okay, on the back of the $1 bill, you have this idea. You see a pyramid here. Manley Hall says that it has 13 rows. Think about that. And it has 72 stones in it. Anuit Coeptus Novus Ordus Seclorum. It represents, it represents the, um, the religion of the giants, the dying God that they worshipped who was going to be resurrected out of the flames one of these days. I have run out of time on this segment. I am not done by any stretch of the imagination. I am not done. We will continue more with the pyramids. We're going to find out what their secret is all about. We're going to study more of how the giants got here. And the only place that we're going to look for positive, 100% proof of how the giants got here is from the words of the King James Bible. I'm just going to cut you off and leave you hanging. I actually have more pyramids to show you, more stories about them. Take too long. We're going to, we're going to keep this going next week. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. And we will see you, the Lord willing, next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.